All right, so uh, thank you very much for joining uh, the uh, TC105 seminars again. Uh, um, we had uh, two uh, seminars already, but it is my pleasure to have Dr. Fonson uh, Richafouf today as a lecturer of the third lecturer uh, from the uh, TC105 Geomechanics from Micro to Macro Seminar Series and entitled Discrete Element Method in geotechnical engineering education. So as I said before, this is the third one. We already had two uh, lectures and uh, they're on YouTube. Uh, I'll send you a link if you're interested in uh, joining, uh, listening to that one as well. But it's really a pleasure to have uh, Fonsan today. So thank you very much for uh, sort of uh, um, agreeing to give this particular lecture. Uh, Walson is an academic from Soils Solid Structure Risk Laboratory 3SR of Grenoble Alpes University. And he's really one of the thought leaders in the area of discrete element method, DEM, lattice element method, and cohesive zone modeling. And it, it'll be uh, his title today is exciting. It's called Let's Code the Discrete Element Method for a Deeper Understanding. Vincent, do you want to start your lecture? I, I, I can. Yeah. Thank you thank for you. the introduction, Finishi. <laughs> and thank you for organizing this, this session. I try to share, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, share. Okay. Yeah. So you should see my screen. I try to. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, as said by uh, Kenishi, I, I will try to introduce, not to introduce the, the, the discrete element method, but try to have a, 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 what I call a deeper understanding. I will try to do my best, <laughs> let's say. <clears throat> oh, I cannot, okay. So the, um, this, this talk is a, is a, I made this talk for those who start to use the, the DM. And the idea is to, to have a practical, uh, a practical view of what is the DM, because uh, often we are user of uh, the DM and we, we may miss some important things with, with the DM. And this is the purpose of this talk. So, uh, um, in this talk, I will use uh, some uh, piece of codes. Uh, we will code actually together, <laughs> let's say. Uh, and uh, we will use for that the JavaScript. JavaScript is not a good language, language for programming the DM because it is slow actually. But for learning, it's, it's a good, good idea because we only need uh, the, the, a navigator like a web browser. Okay, and this is all what, what, we, what we need to, to start to code. Okay, so this is not a good idea to use JavaScript to make, to, to make computation with DM, but for learning, it, it's good because we can display things, it's, all, it, it's nice, okay. We don't need to, compi to compile anything, etc. So some words about me because I've seen that there's a lot of people uh, that I don't know. So I suppose they don't know me. Um, in, in terms of uh, research, what I like to do is explore the scale, okay? I love programming, but this is not the topic, but I love programming, it's, uh, <laughs> we need to know, let's say. <clears throat> and I, I have some experience with uh, the particle-based method. So the, the DM, this is the topic of today, but not, not, not only, I, I know also, I work also with the non-smooth contact dynamics, the lattice element method, the material point, lattice Boltzmann method and other methods. So here are some examples. Here, a case with debris flow, with an open dam, we try to do dimension. Here are some uh, rock falls that are modeled with DM. We can see here that the shape of the blocks are not spheres, they are complex shapes with uh, concavities, etc. Here an example of um, a material point method. So this is a continuous modeling to reinforce a soil with piles. Okay, so there are some examples. 
Another example is the coupling between the lattice ball span method for the freed and the discrete element method for the DM, for, for the, the particles. So they are fully coupled. And uh, I work also on, on the separation of phase between the liquid and gas phase. So this is the kind of modeling that I, I do. <clears throat> I, I make also some experiments on a device named uh, the, uh, one gamma two epsilon to, to track the displacement of each particles. So this is an example here where we, we can, for example, here, uh, track the displacement and compute the, <clears throat> the fluctuations in terms of uh, displacement. Fluctuation is the, 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 the displacement we measure compared to the one we expect. And we see here that the, 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 there are features that are like the turbulence in fluids, but in a static case, a quasi-static case. We are also able to assess the force in experiments thanks to the non-smooth contact dynamics. So there are examples. <clears throat> Here is an, uh, is an example of uh, modeling of DM uh, in 3D, where we are, we are able to glue parts with a kind of uh, solid bond, bonds. And that way, the, the, each particle is breakable. And since we've got a lot of void, which is not accessible at the beginning, when we perform, for example, an endometric uh, compression, uh, we, we can collapse the material. Here, an example uh, which is a kind of mix between the discrete element method and the peridynamics. Peridynamics is a kind of lattice element method, but with the uh, horizon, let's say. We, we assess particles which are far away. So, one more example. And finally, it's not only that, but <clears throat> I work also some on some uh, wh what I call the discrete life element method, where, for example, here uh, each particle is a cell, is a biological cell, which is able to to divide, and that way we can model, for example, the the growth uh, of uh, tumoral uh, clusters. Okay, uh, as you may hear, <laughs> my English is poor. So I hope it will not be uh, too difficult for you to follow. I will do my best, but sorry, my English is poor. So we will do like this. <clears throat> Usually when we start a talk about the discrete element method, we always say that the granular materials are, are omnipresent on the earth. This is true. And we may also say, that everything is granular, everything is discrete. We can start from planets to atoms. We may model quite everything with uh, the discrete element method, a uh, discrete, discrete element method. But uh, actually, this is not true. This is a joke. <laughs> uh, because some, in some case, we need to consider the material as a continuum. Because if not, the, the modeling will not be feasible. In other case, it, it is very interesting to model the, <clears throat> the granular materials with a granular approach. Because th th there are some striking properties in granular materials. To illustrate them, one, one illustration is the, the weighting of granular material. If I take, for example, some chickpeas, I weight this with a weighting matching. I will find a value. If I do the same with the same quantity of, of particles inside the silo, and I'm able to, to, to weight the, the chickpeas at the bottom of the silo, I will find another value. So the, this is easy to explain. This is due to, to the fact that we've got friction uh, on the side of the silo and that the, the, the the force transmission through, through the granular material is special. It, it happens to force chains. And if I want to model this, it, it, this will be very uh, obvious with the granular approach and less easy with a fluid approach, for example. If I model this with a, a non-Newtonian fluid, I'm not sure it will work. 
I will find the same result. With granular materials, with granular DM approach, it will be okay. Another example is the fact that if we take chickpeas, half a liter, and half a liter of couscous, we mix the two, we will not result at, at the end with one liter uh, of volume. This is easy to understand. This is only due to the fact that the small particles will go in between the, the big particles. Very easy to understand, but in terms of modeling, uh, if we use a continuum-based uh, continuum modeling, it will be difficult to model. With GM uh, modeling, it will depend on the shape of the particles. So this is obvious, and it naturally, it, it naturally, naturally uh, happened, or it, it is naturally considered in the discrete uh, element method. Another example is if I've got sand, yeah, in this example, I've got sand in a uh, plastic bottle uh, saturated with, with a fluid. And if we push on the bottle, uh, the fluid will not rise, but go down instead. One more time, this is very easy to understand. This is due to the fact that uh, to be sheared, the, the material needs to to, to, to grow. The, the, the void between the particles need to grow. So if the, the void is bigger, the fluid will go inside. So this is obvious. The explanation is obvious, but for in, in terms of modeling, the fact that we model this from the particle size will take into account this feature naturally. And the last one is the segregation. You, you know that due to particle shapes or other uh, properties in the discrete element method, this will happen naturally and not in the continuum. Okay, <clears throat> so <laughs> I, I may say that the discrete element method is is a lot, a lot better than any other method. <laughs> Still, this is a job, okay? But what I want to say is that only with few features. I can take uh, spherical or disk particles. I implement the contact and the friction, and with only that, with only that, I can model a, a lot of features. The, the 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 fact that the loading, the, that that the, the mechanical response depends on on the history, is okay. The stress softening is okay. The hysteresis in the if I cycle is okay. A lot of things. They, they will emerge naturally from the modeling due to the fact that I take into account the discrete nature of the material. Okay. Okay. So it, it's a lot better. This kind of modeling is a lot better, but there is a price to pay. To pay. Uh, this price is the fact, you know, that if you already practice the DM, is the fact that the, the computation times are extremely long. This is the third point here, but the, I would say this is the first point. When we make simulation, we need a, we often need a lot of particles. It takes a long of time to compute compared to, to the FEM, for example. <clears throat> but there, there are two, two other things which, is, uh, which are difficult. The fact that the sample preparation uh, matters a lot. The, the response, the mechanical response of uh, uh, granular packing will depend a lot on the initial state. And we need to take care uh, uh, about the, the preparation, on the preparation. And, and also, uh, I said that uh, spherical particles are okay. They, they are often okay, but uh, we see more and more that the, the particle shapes matters a lot also in many properties. So the, the, a few words about the origin of the, the discrete element method. This is my story. Maybe other people will not tell the story like this, but for me, the, the origin of discrete element method is the molecular dynamics, which is a method to, to that text that model at the size of the molecules or atoms, okay, 
and the right interactions, potential of interactions like the Lindar Jones one. And, and they say that the force in between the, the atoms or molecules uh, derives from this potential. Okay. So this is the original method for me. And I think maybe the, the story is, is, is wrong, but the, the fact that Kundal uh, in the 18th introduced the, the unilateral elastic repulsion between the, the points or the, the, the particles and the Coulomb frictions make the MD becomes the DEM. Okay. <clears throat> it, it's not important, but I, it's my, my story, <laughs> let's say. I, I would like to go to a, a piece of code to illustrate this. Ah, okay. Uh, so to illustrate this, I, I will start with a piece of code, which is a molecular dynamics code. Uh, some explanation before. This code works in the HTML page, okay? It uses a, a, a library which is named p5.js to, to display things. And the, the code is like this. This is JavaScript. Uh, up. Okay, I think you see. So I, I will <clears throat> not explain how J JavaScript works, but I think the, the things are understandable here. So in this uh, example, I, I will define a particle that has a position, a velocity vector, an acceleration, and we are able to draw the particle. In P5GS, we've got two important um, functions, which is a setup, which is called at the beginning of the program, and a, pro and a, a function named draw that will be called periodically. So this is the place where we perform the integration, OK? <clears throat> so in this example, we've got a, a number of particles, but the particles are actually, let's say, atoms or molecules, and they are 2D, and we will be able to, to play on two parameters, with two parameters, which is the initial density of atoms in, in the cell, in the volume, and the temperature, because the temperature is uh, monitored by, by keeping the kinetic energy constant, okay? So there are two values that are um, that are <clears throat> uh, non-dimensional, unitless uh, uh, values, and we will play with this just to illustrate what the DM, what the MD, the molecular dynamic was. So I run this, and I see here that I've got particles. We integrate the mo motion, and they interact to uh, Lennard Jones potential. Okay. They don't have any boundary, actually. We, I draw here each particle with a circle, but there, there is no boundary because they are atoms or molecules. We are in the situation here where uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a lot of space, so the density is low, and the temperature is, is uh, quite high. Okay, so we've we got what we, we may call a, a gas. I've got here some example where we should end with a, a solid. If I increase the density and I reduce the temperature, okay, I save, reload. This time we've got more, less space between the particles. The temperature is less. So the excitation of the, the molecules are less. And we see that the, the system arranged in, into a crystal, a, a kind of crystal. We may say that this, this corresponds to a solid state. We may also have, uh, just for illustration, a, a liquid. If we decrease a little bit the density and increase the temperature, okay, save, no, save and reload. You see here, we observe a crystal. 
in case of liquid, <coughs> the system is dense, but never arranged into a crystal. Okay. And maybe a funny case where we've, we've got a intermediate case where we may have a coexistence of liquid and gas. So these kind of simulations were the, the initial state of the DM, okay? <clears throat> Here we see that the particle, uh, uh, I, I don't remember the name, the clusterized, the clusterized. So we've got some here, this is, we may see here, this is a liquid and here it is a gas. So we, we have coexistence of the, the two phases. So this kind of modeling is for me the origin of the DM. And what make, make, it, make transform it into a DM is the fact that we consider a surface to the particles. We've got a surface, so we've got uh, contact and we've got also friction. And due to that, it becomes the, the DM. Okay. Oppa. Okay, back to the presentation. <coughs> okay, so I, I, I tell you, I told you that um, what is for me the, the, the origin of uh, the DM, but there exists other methods for modeling discrete um, materials. Uh, one of the most known is the event driven method where we consider the free flight, the, the ballistic uh, trajectory of the particles. And each time we've got a collision, this is an event. And we, we treat the, the collision by saying that there is a restriction in, in uh, the velocity extra. And event to event, we, we, we continue in the simulation. So we don't have a, a constant time increment, but the, the simulation go from event to event, it means from collision to collision, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, due to that, we can model with that a gas, but it's difficult to model a uh, dense granular material. This is doable, but difficult. Another method is the non-smooth contact dynamics, uh, where instead of elasticity between the particles, we will consider uh, uh, condition which is not regular. It's not regular. For instance, for the for the normal contact, it, instead of saying that we've got elasticity in the in the normal direction of contact, we'll say that if we've got contact, so the force is positive. And if we don't have contact, there's no force. It's zero. So this, in terms of uh, mathematics, when we write this, we, we've got for, for, for contact, so when the overlap is zero, we've got an infinity of uh, possible force. So from the mathematical, mathematical point of view, it's not obvious to find the right force. And the non-smooth contact dynamics use the dynamics to, to, to find in the anterior system what could be the force from from the dynamic equilibrium. So <clears throat> this method has the advantage of uh, being, uh, of using bigger time step than the class, classical discrete element method, but it, it is not often used. And this is not the point today. <laughs> today, I will rather talk about the DM, but I, I, I wanted to, to mention this approach. Okay, there, there is another method that uses the elasticity but solve the entire uh, problem by uh, switching between uh, two two projections. The, the the there is globally we've got the projection of the solution which is the elastic solution. So it leads us to a to a solution which is elastic, but due to the the friction, we've got also a plastic solution. So we iterate between elastic plastic solution, and we converge to a good solution in, in a, 
quasi-static state. And this method is not often used, but it is. It, it may be interesting, for example, to assess the force with an inverse approach. There are other methods uh, that, for me, are DEM, but they are, they introduce uh, some facilities. For for example, a specific force law, the particle shapes, and the author of these methods sometimes they name them with another name. Uh, for myself, I have named discrete life element method DLM for the cell uh, div division, but basically they are DM. Another example is the, the what the name? For particle shapes, complex shapes, they, they, they may name something else. Uh, I don't remember the name. And, and if sometimes also when they, introduce some bonds, solid uh, cohesive bonds between the particles. The, the method may be named uh, bonded element method or bonded particles method. And th they have another name, but basically they are DM from the point of view of the, uh, the modeling. <clears throat> so what is them? <laughs> As I said, for me, them is molecular dynamics into which we introduce the frictional contact. So this is them. Um, I would like to mention also another kind of them, DM. This DM is uh, DM to which we introduce a force law, which is very similar to what is observed at, at the macro scale, at, at the big scale. For instance, if, if we observe a softening of the stress at the material, granular material scale, uh, some modeling introduced a softening into the contact law. But for me, this is not them because the contact law reflect what we observe at the map at the big scale. Uh, an alternative would be to use other type of modeling, for instance, the lattice element method or the periodynamics. It, it's not forbidden to use this, this modeling we are allowed to, to make whatever we want, but this, this is a special case of, of uh, modeling, which I, I may not call them GM because the, the, the local force law reflect what we observe at the big scale. And actually in the GM, the mesoscale, the intermediate scales matters a lot. They, they contribute to the, the re mechanical response and we should not use this kind of modeling in GM. One more time, it is a personal opinion. You, you are a lot to be to disagree. <clears throat> so let's start to, to see what the DM is. So basically, the DM will try to solve these equations. What are these equations? This is the se Newton second law for each particle, where we say that the mass times the acceleration of the particle. So dot dot means uh, two times the derived. Uh, with, with respect to time. The mass time acceleration is the sum of the forces that act on the particle plus a volume force, which is, in, in, which is often the gravi gravitational force. And the same for the uh, angular motion. So the inertia, inertia times the angular acceleration is the sum of moment due to the, the forces that act on the particles. So basically, they, they will be the moment due to friction forces, plus eventually the, the, the moment that act directly at the contact points. So this is illustrated for the two decades. I will not go to the ND case like Benji did. <laughs> I will stay 2D and 3D. OK, so basically, the, the, what the DEM is, is to solve this equation. So we will perform a two integration. Starting from the acceleration, we will get the velocity and then we'll get the, uh, the position of the particles. This is what, what, what the DM is. So to do that, we will use some uh, uh, scheme. So what, what we learned, learned 
at, at school is that uh, uh, one scheme is is the earlier scheme, which is the natural scheme, which is the most uh, intuitive scheme. And in the earlier scheme, wh wh what is the point? We take the the position at the moment. We add to the position the velocity times dt, and the result will be the new position. The same for velocity. So we take the velocity, we add the acceleration time, the time step, and we'll get the new velocity. The same for, for angular things. So in, in 3D, we will not use a, we will not use the a scalar value for the angle. We will rather use uh, a matrix, uh, a rotation matrix, or better, a uh, quaternions, which is a mathematical uh, thing that help us to, to describe the, the orientation of the particles in 3D. <clears throat> so uh, this, this scheme is OK for learning, for understanding, but actually it, it's not used because it's, it's not a, Efficient, let's say. Uh, uh, most of you use the integration scheme is the velocity valley, uh, or, uh, sometimes come uh, called uh, leapfrog, or uh, the gear predictor or runchkuta, etc. At different orders. <clears throat> so here is uh, what happened for the velocity values because this, this is the schema I of, often use actually because it, it is simple and, and uh, quite uh, stable. So here we will start with the development up to the acceleration of, of, of each uh, things. So the position plus the velocity times dt plus acceleration times half dt will be the new position. And for the velocity, we will make this in two steps. First, we will compute at time t uh, the velocity plus half the acceleration times dt. In between the two, we will evaluate what is the new acceleration by, by uh, computing the, the resistant force on the particles, okay? Thanks to the force law. The interactions, and then we will update the velocity after estimation of forces uh, with this second part. So the velocity is computed in two stages. First, we update with that. We compute the, the new forces and we update with the second part. And the same for angular velocities. So let's go into an example. Okay. To this example is to illustrate the, the way integration is performed. <clears throat> so we've got here a function where I create a, a canvas on the, on the inter, uh, HTML page. The canvas has this size. The, the background is painted into a light gray. And we will call uh, several times a function named run with three parameters. The function is there, the, and the parameters are an initial velocity and the time step. Okay, so what 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 is done in this? Uh, okay, there is some someone just come. Um, what is done in this uh, function is is the ballistic uh, motion of a point, uh, and we use different values of the time step. So we set the initial position, the initial velocity. This is the gravity. So there are these things. And we loop while the particles is inside the canvas, OK? While the particle is inside the canvas, we will save the current particle position, OK? And we will start the integration, which is a LR time integration here, by seeing that the, the position the new position is the current position plus the velocity, velocity times the time step, okay? We do that for the position and then for the acceleration. 
And then we, we draw a line between the previous position and the current one. Okay. What will happen if we run this small piece of code? Okay. We've got different ballistic ter territories. And we see here that if the time step is big, the, the trajectory will not be accurate at all. And the more the time step is small, and the more the, the trajectory tends to be the correct one. So the ballistic one that can be computed by hand. And this is that one. OK. So it, it just explained you that we, we need to find to the, uh, the correct time step. What will happen if, for instance, we, we compute the velocity before the position? So we just need to put this piece of code just before. There's no reason to, to, to make the position before, to update the position before the, the velocity. So let's do that. OK, save and update. OK, Th this time we will end at the end with the smaller time step to the correct territory. But this time we overestimate the 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 height of the territory. So I, I don't know what is the better solution. But one more time, this this uh, this scheme is not a good scheme because this is the simplest one. It is not very stable. So let's go back to that solution. OK, I, I hope you understand a little, the, even if you are not a programmer, because it's, I think it's quite understandable. Okay. OK, what was my plane? What is the time? I spent a lot of time. OK, so now that we have seen more or less how to integrate the, the the particle trajectories, we will have a look on the on the interaction forces. Uh, what is the upper? Okay. So to, to, to make a DM model, we need a, a local model, force law, that will act in between the particles. Okay. Uh, well. OK, and, and why we need this force law is because this force law, when we will divide the force, the resultant force on the particles by the mass, and the same for, for rotation, we'll get the acceleration. And th this, the acceleration is what will be integrated two times. OK. Uh, <clears throat> there, there is something red here I have recalled that uh, the force law is not the constitutive law in the sense of this is not what we will get at the end at the mic at the big scale. The force law is the is a law to, which is local, and the mass macroscopic re response uh, will of the granular uh, packing will will be influenced by the fabric by the arrangement of the particles themselves. So the mesoscale, the, the mesoscale matters a lot. So the constitutive law at the large scale is not the force law. This is important to stress. So maybe quick, oh, where is my presentation? <laughs> OK. Uh, some other examples. OK. Also, you need, you, need share, you need to share your screen. I think it... uh, my, my, my screen is not shared anymore. Yeah. yeah. OK. It's not. Sorry for that. Uh, up. There you go. OK. <clears throat> I, I will try to be faster because I, I, I see that the time advance. <laughs> OK. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so this is another example where I will try to illustrate the, the introduction of, of, of a force law. So I will integrate the particles, the particle position and velocity and acceleration. There will be only one particle, but this time the particle is attached to a point with a spring, a linear spring. So in the model, what will happen? Uh, try to be so i integrate i update the position still with the error scheme of the particle we compute the distance of the particle with the with uh, where the spring is attached so it is at, attached at the position zero zero i define a vector which is the direction of the spring okay and then i say that the the force due to the spring that act on the particle is a, a, a stiffness times the elongation or shortening of the spring, which is the length minus, minus the initial length. So this is the force. This is how I, I, I introduced the, the force law in the model. And, and to get the acceleration, I just divide this force by the mass of the particle. Okay. So then I project onto the, the two directions because we are in 2D. And I, with this acceleration of particle, I'm able to update the velocity of the particle. OK. If I do that, and th there are some display things, if I do that, I will get this, this kind of modeling. So yet, this is not a DM code. <laughs> this is just an illustration of on uh, how to introduce a force law in a model. <clears throat> so we, yeah, we, we've, got, we've got a kind of a pendulum. Uh, this is the word, yes, pendulum uh, that oscillate like this. And we, we've got no dissipation in this case. But dissipation is something uh, which is important. So uh, an easy way to dissipate energy is to multiply every time step the velocity by a, a value which is slightly smaller than one. In, in this case, we will observe dissipation. And if I rerun the simulation by including this time the dissipation, we'll see that the pendulum will, will want to, to stop, okay? So th there are other way to dissipate energy. I will talk about them. Maybe this is brutal force. <laughs> this is not a good way to dissipate energy. It, it was just for illustration, okay? But we may consider that the particle is inside the fluid, which is true because it, it is inside the hair, which is a fluid. Oh, where is mouse? Oh. And that's it. So now let's go to another example where we will consider this time. Uh, what is the example? This time we've got uh, another kind of interaction. This time we don't have uh, a spring between the, the particles, but something which is similar to the gravity between planets. Okay. So uh, normally the, the, the force law that we should use, the force law which is due to gravity between planets is some things like a, a, a gravity constant times the the, we, we multiply the mass of the two interacting bodies and divide by the distance which is squared between the, the bodies, the planets, okay? Here for the illustration, we, I, I will consider that the mass of the, planet, the, of the two planets, let's say the sun uh, and the earth, is one, okay? And the uh, gravity constant is something which is uh, random, okay? Just for illustration. And, the, the, and in this case, when I write the the force law we see here when we compute the acceleration it will be the gravity constant times the the the, the masses okay they are one actually i should re remove this and and instead of dividing by the the distance which is squared i will divide by the distance because if not the, the computation will be hard 
uh, we need very small time step. So this is just for an illustration. So one more time, when I've got the force, which is computed with this force law, I will divide by the mass, the mass of the, the body which is integrated, the body which moves, okay? And this will, this will lead to uh, the acceleration that I will integrate, okay? So if I illustrate this, okay, we can see that the, the, the earth, the, the, the earth turn around the sun, let's say the black sun. <laughs> uh, or just for fun, if I remove here in this in the draw function, the this function that will erase the background, okay, with a light gray. If I we will we will see the territory, okay. Okay. So this is not different from the, the spring, but this time we've got another force law, okay? In this illustration. Uh, okay. Now let's go on the third example where we try to have more than one planets uh, around the sun, okay? In this time, in this case, sorry, what will happen? We've got more than one planet that turn that turn uh, around the, the the sun. So instead of in the integrating the motion of only one particle, we will particle or planet, we will integrate uh, many. So they will be inside uh, an array. Okay. So yeah, the, we've got an array names grain, and we will loop over all grains. Okay, for each grain, I will start to update the position like I did. I will compute uh, a force with a force law. Okay, this is uh, uh, actually here, Fn is already the acceleration due to, to the fact that, that the mass is one. And then to, to activate the, the interaction between each planet and the sun, I will loop over all, all, all the grains and compute the force between, between the grains. Okay. Actually, I, I loop here over all the grains and I loop here over, over all the other grains, okay? If the grain is itself, if grain I is grain J, so I, I will do nothing, okay? If not, I, I will compute the, the, the interacting force and integrate. So this is what the, uh, the, DM, the DM code will do. But here, this is a brute force because I will loop over all the particles. If I do that, it, it will be super inefficient, okay? But for the example, I, I will just illustrate with that. Okay, if I do that, yeah, I've got four planets that interact in between them, okay, and also with the sun. So how to do that in the, in the modeling, we will loop over all possible interaction. In practice, what we will do is we will maintain a list of possible uh, neighbors. If the particles are close enough, uh, we will consider them. And it, it will save a lot of time. Okay. I'm very, very late. So I will try to be faster. Okay. Um, up. So still, you, you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay. So some illustration of what are the, the force laws that we may use. The, the one which is, the, the let's say, the most known is the Earth's model, where we consider that the, the, in our modeling, the sphere, the, the particle are disks or spheres, and they will overlap. And the overlap will be, will be said to be nearly what uh, the deflection of the particles, like we see here in photoelasticity, photoelasticity symmetry, okay? And 
the the Edson uh, contact uh, predict that uh, according to some assumptions the the deflection the the, the force will be will be some something uh, uh, proportional to the the to the deflection at the power three halves. Okay, so the, this mod, mod, this model is is uh, often used. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that if we use this model, the deflection has to be small, the particles are said to be smooth, and there, there are numbers of uh, assumption, assumptions. Okay, so most of time we don't need such a model, because if we don't focus on, for example, the wave propagation, the elastic waves propagation to guard the, 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 the granular packing, we don't need such model. All we, we need is to say that the particles cannot overlap, not too much, okay? So in many cases, we will rather for use a model which is simple, which is a, a spring. So we will say that the, the, the force is proportional to the overlap, okay? Uh, by introducing a, a stiffness parameter, a normal stiffness par parameter. So in many, many cases, this is sufficient to model uh, uh, what we want to model, but not always. We, we may see also this, this law as the, the, the condition I, I, I talk about with the non-smooth contact dynamics, which has been uh, regularized, okay? So because most of time, not always, most of time, we don't mind about elasticity in the geomechanical problem. The elasticity is not so uh, important. What matters is the plastic uh, straining. Okay, so most of time this KN will be chosen so that the competition is easy to perform, to run. So it it will not necessarily uh, um, translate what is the elastic elastic parameters of the granular materials, uh, elastic properties. Okay, but not always. We may also introduce a viscosity at the contact. So by introducing this law, the, the, the force, the viscous force will depend on the relative velocity, which is the, the end dot. And we will multiply this velocity by a parameter, which is a viscous parameter, let's say. So we, we use this, this model when it is physically sound. If, if, if we've got a viscosity in, in the particles uh, material, we, we may use this law. If the viscosity is in the, what is in between the particles, we may use this law, but sometimes we may also use this law to, for numerical reason only, just for dissipating energy, okay? The friction law, which is very important. Uh, most of the time it is implemented in the model uh, incrementally. So we will say that the, the, the tension force is uh, proportional to the sliding, to, to the, yes, sliding motion, let's say. But we will write this incrementally. Why? Because we, we will implement a, a kind of plasticity, a perfect plasticity. And we will say that when the, the friction force reach uh, a value which is, uh, mu times the normal force. So the friction coefficient times the normal force, it will be, um, uh, it will stay at the uh, constant value. Okay, the, the way of implementing this law is not okay because it is not, uh, what the word, it is not uh, ob objective. This is not an, an objective law. Because if the particle rotate at the same time that it slides, we will lose information. It will depend on the story, let's say. So this is not an objective law, but I don't know any uh, DM code that implement something which is different than that, okay? So basically we will write elastic uh, relation between sliding motion, an increment of sliding motion and the, sli uh, the friction force. 
and we will threshold the value to mu fn. So that way we will introduce the friction coefficient that correspond to the cone that I have written here. You know that. Okay. So dissipation, I have said, we need to dissipate energy. Uh, the most known way to dissipate energy is the Kundal, what we call the Kundal damping. Uh, basically, this is a numerical trick, I think, uh, that says that if the velocity, the relative velocity and the acceler acceleration is not, no, is in the same direction, so we will add a kind of parachute uh, on the particles. So it is artificial. It cannot create energy. It, it, it only dissipates. Yeah, and I think that it should be used only in the static case to improve the static equilibrium. If we perform a simulation which is uh, dynamic, uh, for example, a steady flow or something, uh, we should not use this, this damping. Okay. One more time, this is a personal opinion. <laughs> uh, you, you are able to do what you want, but I think this, this damping is a kind of, is dangerous if you want to, if you are in the dynamic situation. We may also introduce a kind of fluid in the model by saying that the resultant velocity of each grain is, uh, is multiplied by a factor, okay? It will result, and this factor has to be less than one, obviously, okay? And we will dissipate energy like. And we can also introduce the, the dissipation inside the, the force law themselves. This is the case with viscosity and with friction. So the, the material will dissipate energy like, like this. Okay, to, to set some parameters, to set some parameters, uh, we can rely on some, some pictures that are, for example, for a contact, a mass with a spring, okay? If we consider this, we, we, we can rely on this uh, ODE equation, okay? Mass acceleration plus uh, stiffness time displacement. We call displacement here, U. And if we solve this equation, we will find a, a sign, okay? It will be a sign. But if we consider uh, a collision, we, the, the, the U will de define a, a, a U shape, okay, a U shape, which is a part of the sign signal, okay, and so the the, the size of this U U shape will impose that the, the time step is half a period of the sign, okay, and half of the period of the sign is that. This is why we often see sometimes the pi is not there, a critical uh, time step which is the square root of m over kn, if we model this with a spring, obviously. So this is fine everywhere. We may improve a little bit the model by introducing the viscosity, but in this case, if we do the same thing, we will find a critical time step, which is a slightly larger than the one we defined just before. So, square root of m over kn is what we refer to, to if we, we want to define a time step, okay? This is an explanation. This is not the only one. So in practice, what we will do is we will compute, we will define for our simulation what is the critical time step, and we will, part, we will, we will take a part of this time step. For instance, we will divide this critical time step by 50, okay? And the number, this key parameter is something which is empirical. We have to play with the simulation to, to know what is the good value, okay? So I, 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 I'll advance to be a little faster because I see that we approach the one hour talk. Um, a few words about the, the value of the viscosity in between the particles. So still, we, we can rely on this picture of uh, a mass, which is with uh, a spring and a dash pot in parallels. So the equation is, is there. 
And if we do that, the solution of this equation will be something that will be a kind of uh, a sign which is amortized or something which is amortized. But if we want that the particle is able to go back when we consider a, a collision, we need, we need waves, okay? And to obtain waves, it, uh, I will not enter in the mathematics, but it, we need that the determinant is, uh, I don't remember, uh, negative or I don't remember, but we need by considering the determinant that the critical uh, viscosity is this. So two times the square root of M times Kn. So for practical reason, instead of setting this value, which is uh, we, that will change if we change the, the Kn or the mass, the mass, we will introduce another parameter, which is defined in between one, uh, zero and one, excluding zero. And we will define the viscosity as a portion of the critical one, but it will never be the critical one. So let's quick, quickly have a look on the on a piece of code. And I've said that this code may be called our first dem code. So you, you, you see, with very few number of lines of code, including display, only less than uh, 4,000, 400, we have a kind of DM code. This is not a code we, we will use for, for writing papers. This is only for learning, OK? So in, in this code, I defined a, a particle with a, a position, mass, inertia, radius, rotation, velocity, angular velocity, acceleration, resultant force, and resultant moment. What I, I call here F, F rot is, is a force of rotation, <laughs> so a moment. Something to do on the particle. We've got a, a, an entity which is a neighbor that will store which particle is close to which one. We've got a list of, of particles, some data that, we, that I will not define, a list of neighbors that will be used to improve a little bit the, 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 the speed. And we've got this time function to compute the, um, the force in between the particles. Okay, so here K, K is not the stiffness, but this is the index of the neighbors, the particles that are neighbors. Okay. So you see this time is a little bit uh, longer. And we, we also manage the, the force in between the particles and the walls. So the particles will be inside the box. So we've got four walls and there, there is no friction between particles and the walls. Here we've got something to update the neighbor list. And to, to do that, we, we, we will loop over all the particles. So it will be a, and the, the efficiency of the, the, the solution will be a, what we call O and squared efficiency, okay? So it is not efficient. We've got other method to, to deal with that, but for, for this introduction, it will be okay. And th there is something else. When we update the neighbor list, we, we need to keep track on the, the friction force because the friction force is updated and we need the previous force. And if we update the list of neighbors without keeping the, the force that were already there, we will lose them. So there, there is a trick here to, to retrieve the previous pairs with the forces when we rebuild the, the list. I, I, I have no time to explain this, sorry. So here, what is done in the computation is just we, we put the particles on the grid and we let them fall, okay? So just to have a look on the result, Okay, we've got particles in the box. They have random position on the grid at the position. They have random size. Uh, the color is the velocity of the particle. They fall down, they form uh, packing. Uh, these lines is the force, the normal force that are displayed as usual 
with a thickness which is proportional to the normal force. So we see here a simulation that kind of works and we only see the deposit of the particles. Okay. So uh, you may see that there is a very few ingredients in this simulation. Okay. We've got only friction and the uh, contact. Okay. And just to illustrate what uh, a simulation may look like um, uh, for a student that start using the DM. If you start using the DM, you may quasi for sure, it happens for me uh, even now, that your time step will not be correctly uh, set at the beginning. So as I said that the critical state uh, time step is pi. So this is pi times the square root of the mean mass over the, the stiffness, okay? And I have to, to select, to choose uh, a part of this critical time step to make my simulation. But most of time, uh, we do want to, to use a, a small time step because we are we need to, to have the solution. So let's say I, I will, for an example, take divide the, the critical time step by five only. What will happen? So I save the, the code and I rerun the simulation. So basically, this is what we, you will have in your first simulation, blasting. <laughs> and you will say, this is shit. DM is not working. I don't like DM because it does not work. It, it's a, it's, uh, so it depends too much on the parameters. So the, most of time, the reason is the time step is not set correctly. So one idea often is to, to reduce the, the stiffness because if I reduce the stiffness, the, the computation will be easier to do. But it, sometimes it's not a good idea because uh, your particle will be too soft and it's, uh, it, physically it will have consequence on the arrangement of the particles. So it's, it's often it's not a good idea to, to reduce too much the, the value of Kn. If I, if I divide by 10, uh, what will happen? Okay, it seems that 10 is enough, but actually you will see you will see that it is not because things seem to be okay, but you you see that locally, you you still observe some some instabilities that will never disappear. So this value of time step with respect to the critical time step is something you have to experiment by yourself. So here we see that it doesn't work. It's easy to see because we we've, we've got the display here. But when you, you will perform a simulation with your own code or with the, the, the commercial code or whatever, you, maybe you will not have this. You, you will only observe the blasting. So here I find that uh, 15 may, may be a good parameter. So I save, if I run, it, it will be okay. So just for illustration, what will happen if I decrease too much the stiffness? So the, yeah, the, the stiffness was 1000. I, I set it to 100 and we see that we, we, we see some waves and we see that the particles are very soft. So this may be something which is not physically okay. Okay, it depends on what you, you are looking for. Uh, I, I will have no time to, to, to speak about this. But uh, normally what, what is advised to, to do is to rely on a parameter which is dimensionless. Instead of setting the, the stiffness parameter itself, you will set a parameter which is, uh, which is for instance, the, the size of the parameter with respect to the size of the overlap you want to, to model. And you will then compute the, the stiffness as a function of this parameter. I see that 
I, I spend more than one hour to, to speak about this. So maybe I will not have time to, to, to speak about this. So uh, Kenishi, do I have time to? Yeah, you can go for another five minutes or so. If you can wrap it up, if that's okay, or what okay. do you think? You can go for five to ten minutes. I think. Uh... Okay, so uh, I, I will. I will not end my what I plan to to, to say. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I think we can go because I think for those who are staying on, we'll just like okay. listen. It. This will be recorded, so so. so uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's you. better to do what you like to do. So, so how many more okay. slides? Yeah, yeah. Keep on going. Thank you. So yeah, still, for example, I, I will set the equation between the particles. I, I, in the normal direction, on, in the normal force in between the particles, I will add a constant value, which is negative, okay? It will add equation to the particles, just for illustration. And what will happen if I do that? So I save the code, I will run the simulation, and you will see that this time the, the, the particle will glue and it will end with a, a packing which is loser because we will see some, some space that will appear here. And we will be able in this case to build a sample which is loser, okay? And this is not doable, for instance, if we increase the, the friction. So you see here, we've got big holes. This is due to the fact that I add some equation. If I remove the equation, but increase the friction to a big value, I will exaggerate. I will set the, the equation to 10, which is not okay because the equation, the friction cannot be 10. Okay? 100, okay. <laughs> so big, big friction, big, big friction. And we'll see what will be the result. So the particle, the particles deposit. And, and we see that even if the friction is very, very big, the, the packing will, will be quite dense at the end. Okay. So if you, for example, in the case you want to to build the sample which is loose, Some, sometimes we want to, to, to model such things because we want to model the collapse of uh, snow, for example. Uh, uh, preparing a sample with a, uh, with a lot of friction is not sufficient. We will need to add something else. On the contrary, if you want to make a simulation with zero friction, in the real life, we cannot do that, but in simulation, you can, <laughs> you are a lot. What will happen? You will build this, the sample, which is the densest possible. Yeah, because we don't have friction, we see that the particle, when they touch, they cannot rotate. And at the end, so the simulation is less stable. And at the end, we, we will have a very, very dense packing, okay? This is nearly all what I wanted to say about this. Okay. Okay. So, so now since I've got a few time, I, I, I will speak a, a little bit about some uh, dimensionless numbers that may help you to make simulations at the beginning, always, because they are dimensionless, okay? So the first one is what we may call kappa. We often call it kappa. It measures what, what is the, the, the diameter of the particle with respect to the overlap we want to model. So this kappa will depend on the pressure that act on the particles. So, after some computation, if we apply a, a pressure on the pairs of particles uh, and we, we write the equilibrium, the static equilibrium, equilibrium of this, uh, this system, this small system, we will find that kappa may, may be defined as the stiffness uh, 
divided by the pressure we applied times the mean diameter at the power uh, dimension minus two. Okay, dimension is for for example if if we model in three D it will be uh, three, <laughs> in two D it will be two. So in case of two D simulation, this uh, mean diameter will not be there because two minus two is zero. Okay. So the kappa in 2D will be Kn over P. And thanks to this kappa, we, we, we have the possibility to, to set the stiffness, knowing the pressure we will apply on the system, and by considering the overlaps. And this is OK. This is good because this is a, a value that we can feel. So in practice, we, will, we may say that uh, uh, when particles are rigid, the overlap is small. We, we, it's, we, we may consider that kappa is uh, 1,000. Less than 1,000 is it's, uh, for soft particles. OK? So in, the per, in simulation you already performed, maybe you, 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 you could compute what kappa is to, to verify, to check if kappa is less than 1,000. If not, be careful, because your particles may be too soft. And the physics that will uh, that will be shown may be influenced by this softness. Okay. Another non-dimensionless value is the is a value to set the. You remember alpha in what I presented is the factor to set the viscous the viscous viscosity between particles. So. It, 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 sometimes it's hard to, to, to know what value should be chosen. So instead of this value, we may rely on the restitution parameter. This restitution is, can be seen as if you, if you collide a particle with another one, uh, what will be the velocity after collision compared to the velocity before collision? So physically, we can feel what this parameter is. And we can set the alpha as a function of this restitution. We may also consider, instead of restitution in terms of velocity, we may consider the, the restitution in terms of energy. So energy after we respect to energy before. In this case, we, we will rely on the En squared, and it will be OK. Another parameter is the inertial number, which is well known in the physical community. Uh, so we, we may compute the, define this number as a function of pressure, mass, and the uh, and the uh, straining, the strain rate of our system. And why it is interesting because we know the the limit. If we want to limit something which is quasi static, which is a liquid, which is a, a gas, we know what the uh, initial number should be the order of magnitude. For instance, if I is 10 at the, at the power minus 4, we may consider that this system is uh, quasi-static. And why it is interesting? Because when we, for instance, we will uh, want to model a biaxial compression, we will need to define the velocity of the walls at the boundaries. And to define this velocity and ensure that we are in the quasi-static uh, regime, for example, for instance, we will choose we will choose a, a value for i and set the velocity of the boundaries so that the i is is uh, is okay, okay. And the friction coefficient is already uh, um, uh, non-dimensional uh, parameters. So I, I, I will. Um, a property of interest is the connectivity, so no comments. Uh, the solid fraction that we will prefer many times rather than the void ratio or the porosity. Most of time, I will prefer to use the solid fraction, which is uh, more clear, let's say, to understand. And to finish, the, maybe the, the, the few last slides, uh, what we can do to upscale. So wh what is often do when we, are, we have forces between the particles and if we want to assess the, 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 the stress tensor uh, at, at the large scale, we will use 
very often what, what, what is known in literature as the love Weber equation. So this equation says that the, the, the stress, yeah, we've got one component of stress, the component alpha beta of the stress tensor is the sum of the forces between the particles, component alpha, times the component beta of the branch vectors. So the, the vector that is between the centers of, of particles. So we do that for all the contacts. And at the end, we, we divide by the volume, the total volume. And we, if we do that for each component of the stress, we will end with a, a stress tensor, which is the global stress tensor. And that way we will upscale the, the, the contact force to the stress tensor. The, so this is the, the classic way to obtain the, the stress tensor at the large scale. If we are din dynamic in the dynamic simulation, this is not sufficient. We will need to add another component that accounts for the particle velocity. But most of time, most of time, this additional component is negligible. We don't need that. Even if, uh, even if the flow is quite uh, fast. And last thing, this, this uh, relation assume that we, we don't have any uh, volume force. So in case of gravity, we should not use this. But in practice, if, if we use this equation, even if the gravity is, uh, is set in the simulation, it will be OK. In practice, it works, OK? If we want to, to go at the small scale, the smaller scale where we, we are able to define the stress tensor is the particle, because this is the smallest entity. So in this case, we've got another uh, relation with, which is very similar to the Love-Weber equation. But this time, we will sum each force, the component alpha of a force, by the position of the contact. If we do that, if we do th that sum for any component, we will have a tensor, which is named the, the moment tensor, moment tensor. And if we divide this moment tensor by a volume, we will end dimensionally, dimensionally to uh, the, the stress tensor. It will be the mean stress tensor of the particle. So we can do that for all the particles. But there is a question, what should be the volume to be considered? We may consider the volume of the particle is itself. But in this case, if we sum the, the stress of all the particles, it, it will be in, it will not be an extensive uh, variable. We cannot sum them. But what, depending on what you are looking, you are regarding, you, you may consider the, 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 the volume of the particle as the volume to be used here. You may also consider the volume of a cell that surround, surround the particle, for instance, with the Voronoi test selection. OK. So this is a way to assess the, the stress at the scale of the scale at the scale of the particles. But we, we cannot go below. If we want to have a, 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 a gradient of stress here, it, it is not possible actually, directly from the, the forces. But in some cases, for example, when the particles are elongated, we've got the case here in these simulations. We, we can re rely, rely on, for example, here, the, the beam theory. We are thanks to the beam theory, we are able to assess the, 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 the stress inside the particles uh, from the forces that act on it. OK, I think uh, it's done. Sorry for the time I spent. Oh, awesome. Thanks a lot. That's been fascinating. Um, Let's invite some questions. I think it'll be good to have a few questions. Um, anybody who can ask? I hope yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, st still, we still have participants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We still have a good number of participants. Uh, Joel? Yeah, I, I see a couple in the chat, so maybe we can start with those. Um, one is asking about experience with different numerical methods and which method is maybe most suitable for sewage, uh, soil permeability 
at the meso scale. Permeabilities. So in this question, you consider the field in between the particles. And the question, as I understand it, is about the modeling of fluids in the part between the particles. That's it. You don't know? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think it's so related to the work that you're doing with Lattice Boltzmann okay. method, I think. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, yeah. it, with this method, we may model the fluid with Lattice Boltzmann in between the particles. For, for reali realizing a complete coupling, we need to consider the, the pressure and velocity that act on the particles to 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 sum them in the in the DM computation, and on the other side, we, we need to to consider the velocity at the boundary of the particles to introduce it in the fluids. So for the the permeability, you can you can use this approach, the lattice Boltzmann, but in this case, the 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 computation will be long. Be, be, because we need a lot of uh, nodes inside in the pore space. And actually there, there exists another method uh, that I do not practice, but it is something which is done at uh, our, in our lab by Bruno Charrer. Maybe you, you know him. Uh, he, he considered the, the uh, pore between uh, tetrahedron formed by four particles as the entity. And it will, it will model the, 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 the free transfer, transfer between these pores uh, with a model which is like a, a pore networks. Yes. Okay. Uh, with kind of quasi uh, flowing between the pores. Yeah. And for that, it will rely on the tessellation, uh, 3D tessellation and the and the the push the coefficient will be it depends on the interfaces. Yeah. Okay. So you, if you this is very efficient, and in this method you accept to 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 simplify the the, the pore network. So depending on what you are interest, interested in, this method may be a lot a lot a lot faster. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so when you compare that poor network model with Lattice Boltzmann, have you done that in 3D? No, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. Maybe Bruno Charia did that. I, I've seen uh, one of his students that, that did that. I, I, personally, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's related one related to, uh, oh, no, no, that's different. Joe, do you want to ask a question? Then I can sort of look at the other questions. Sure. I yeah, I was wondering that it was it was really nice to see some of the Java um, simulations just to quickly develop and quickly see some results. Um, but I wondered maybe if there was a specific language or library or open source or commercial program uh, that you maybe point students towards, like after they get the first taste with uh, Java. <laughs> okay, J J J JavaScript, it was just for me for explaining, you're, you're okay. I've said that Java, JavaScript is not the good, the good language to, to, to make simulation. So my advice would be to, if you want to develop your own code, you should start with a language which is compilable, like Fortran if you want. I prefer C, C, C++, okay? They are a good point to, to, to start. But there exist in the, in the world many uh, already developed uh, tools that are sometimes free, sometimes not. I would advise to use a free one <laughs> for obvious reasons. The, the, at Grenoble, we, we've got YAD, YADE, yes. which is code in the C++. There, there, there exists a large community who use this, this code. It, it, it has a nice interface also uh, with Python. You, you may also use uh, light. You know light, maybe light or lamps. Yeah. Okay. Or 
a commercial one, PFC. It depends on how rich you are. <laughs> uh, the, the point is that when you use, I, I, I'm not sure I'm answer co correctly to, to the question, but when you use a, a, a quad that has a community, you, you have, you, my advice is to be careful. You will, at a certain point, because you read the documentation, etc., you will follow a, a, a way to do of the community. I don't know how to say. So the, the, the community will have some practices, okay? And you, you will follow these practices. For me, this is not a good point because it will, it will, I don't know the word. We constrain you to, to be like the other. You will not be inventive, <laughs> okay? So the, the, if you have the possibility, you are the one who, who, who asked the question, prefer the solution to make your own code. But obviously it, not so, it, it is not a, always doable because, uh, okay, DM is easy to program, but you will need something to display things. Maybe if you've got many particles, you will need to use a GPU. <laughs> and do it yourself is very hard. So in, in such a case, I, I, my advice is to use a, a, a quad that is already written, that has a large community, but you, sh you should be careful that the community may have some practice, some way to do that may block you in your research at a, a given point. So be inventive in this case. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, Shi Wei Zhao, Dr. Shi Wei Zhao will be giving a next lecture about open source DN. So, so, so there's some discussion on that open source DN uh, in the next uh, fourth lecture that we're lined up for. Um, uh, Shi Wei is asking, is this interactive JavaScript available for us to have a little? Uh, I, I can't. I can send it through you yeah. <laughs> if you want. Yeah. Th there's no problem. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, okay. But the, yeah, also thanks a lot. The final question it, is the stiffness value, KN or something like, how yeah. do you determine, there's a question about physical nature. How, what is the good value that you said soft is not good, but it must be related to mineralogy of the particles and that sort of thing characteristic of particles? Do you have a rule of thumb that you tend to use? Uh, one more time, the rule is empirical, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we, say, saying that uh, so, two stuff is, is not good is, is not right, actually. So, sometimes particles are soft, but sometimes they are not. And some properties, some global properties, if the particles are too soft, too soft, may be not well interpreted. Okay, so my practice is to say that I, I want Kn be the smallest possible because I want to have the biggest time step possible. Okay, right. Right. okay. So I, I, I've got a limit is to say if my particles is said to be uh, stiff, okay, K, 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 kappa should not be less than 1000. It is super empirical, okay? And that's all. Yeah. Awesome, thanks you very much. Well, thank you very much for your nice presentation. There were a lot of code. We went through the code that you showed and then there were illustration and how contact laws can change the sort of a structure of the pores and all these things. That was really, really nice. And it would be good for our students to try your code, look at the code, and then that's what you say. Let's learn how to code it and then see how the DM works. So thank you very much for your nice presentation today. You're welcome. I hope it will help. Yeah. Maybe. What I want to, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. What I want to do is to uh, sh just share my screen to see what's coming up next. <clears throat> so just for um, what's coming, in the lecture four. So, so we had already had lecture one, lecture two. 
Uh, I will distribute this. There's a YouTube link already. And then today's lecture will have a YouTube link as well. Uh, next lecture will be April 26th on Tuesday um, by Dr. Shiwei Zhao using open source DM and teaching. And then a uh, following month on May 24th, we'll have uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar talking about building a real-time interactive playground with the Institute of Viz and Deep Learning. So, so that's something a little bit more research area, but something that you may get excited to uh, join. So that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much, Wong It was great to see you. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm, uh, there's still a lot of people left. So uh, everyone, thank you very much for joining this seminar. And hopefully you join the next one. And hope you have a good day or good night or good morning. Goodbye. Thank you.